Hi, it's Dwyer. Dwyercrime.blog. I'm a divorce attorney, not a civil litigator. I'm a divorce attorney in Silicon Valley, Mountain View, California. Right, just finished a expensive trial. Have another one that's going to trial in early April. But in my free time, as many people here know, I like to talk about big criminal cases that have happened, and I like to offer opinions on the evidence and on whether or not I feel the accused was guilty or innocent. For more information on me, you can find my law firm listed at richarddwyer.com. Let's talk about the O.J. Simpson case. This is that rare video I'm going to dedicate to a member of my family. I'm going to dedicate this to my Aunt Blossom, who is in her late 80s. She has very strong opinions on this case. Her sister, my mother, did as well before she died. Right? Let's just say in my family, there were differences of opinion on this case. So it is 2 p.m. on June the 12th, 1994. O.J. Simpson calls his girlfriend, Paula Barbieri. She wants to come to daughter Sydney's recital. Here, O.J. makes, in my opinion, his first mistake of the day right at least a part of the day that I know about he turns her down after all his ex-wife Nicole was gonna be there in fact at the recital OJ sits near Nicole and the Brown family right in my opinion OJ Simpson should have mentally moved on from his hopes of a relationship with his wife and he should have pivoted toward his girlfriend. As it was, Paula Barbieri, after getting blown off by O.J. Simpson, decides to go to Las Vegas and ends up hanging out instead with Michael Bolden. Bolton, right? A popular singer at the time. So, let's get deeper into the night. Around 6.30 p.m., O.J. Simpson returns from the recital and he talks to his tenant, Cato Kalin. Here is where O.J., in my opinion, makes mistake number two. He complains to Cato that Nicole was wearing a tight dress. He is also upset that she would not allow him to go to dinner with her and her family. Right? By the way, as I mention these facts, understand many of these people are still alive. Right? Cato Kalin is still alive. If you're a member of the media, I would encourage you to track him down, to ask him about this conversation. There's a story there. Well, let's continue. OJ makes mistake number three at 7.35 p.m. He calls Gretchen Stockdale. He leaves a message. In the message, he says, it's Orenthal Jones, right? Orenthal Jones, who is finally at a place in his life where he is like totally, totally unattached, right? OJ clearly, after turning down his girlfriend, going to the recital, Complaining about Nicole's dress, he's clearly lonely. He wants company at 7.35 p.m. 
Now at this point, let me offer my opinion. I don't believe OJ is planning on killing anyone that night. He is too open. He talks to his girlfriend. A Machiavellian type would have had her at the recital. Would have used her as a possible alibi. Would have used her to argue that his state of mind was elsewhere, not on the coal. That's if he was thinking of committing a murder and wanted to set up the dominoes. So after the murder, he would then be able to point to people who he was using as props to make the argument of, look, I was, I was with my girl at the recital, right? I, I wasn't hanging around Nicole hoping for any kind of reconciliation. Also, in addition to talking to his girlfriend and turning her down, he talks to Cato about Nicole's dress. Why would you do that? Right? Why would you, knowing that if anything happens, one of the people the police would want to talk to in terms of trying to figure out exactly what your actions were, was your house tenant? Why would you talk to the house tenant about your ex-wife in a way that was less than complimentary. Right? Also, why talk to Nicole about going to dinner? Isn't that filled with risk? Because if you're planning on killing Nicole, there's the risk that after you have the conversation with her, she might talk to members of her family. Aren't they close to her? She might say, you know, Mom, OJ wanted to come to dinner with us. Those members of the family would then be able to relay that story to the police. So, let me just say this. In my opinion, and I'm just offering it so you know where I'm going. O.J. Simpson, on the 12th of June, 1994, was clearly not over his ex-wife. Right? And... He wasn't shy, in my opinion, in terms of talking about that relationship to third parties. So I believe at the recital, after the recital, when O.J. Simpson wants to go to dinner and stuff like that, when O.J.'s talking to Cato later, I don't think O.J. Simpson at that moment had a plan to kill anyone. So, let's get deeper into the night. At 9, 10 p.m., and let's pay attention to the timeline, right? As his wife and Ron Goldman, according to at least some reports, would be murdered about 70 minutes later, right? OJ makes his next mistake. He goes to McDonald's with Cato in his Bentley. Now let me just say this. OJ Simpson at the time was one of the most recognizable people in Southern California. Let me say a personal story here. I was once at the cottage in Laguna Beach, a restaurant down there. I saw a crowd of kids around a guy having food. The guy turned out to be O.J. Simpson, right? He was with a woman who was absolutely gorgeous. I don't think it was Nicole. O.J. was signing napkins for the kids. I ran to a payphone. This is years ago. This is before the latest technology. I fished for coins. I called my dad in New York City. I said, Dad, you won't believe this. I'm at a restaurant and I'm looking at O.J. Simpson. My father and I laughed, right? O.J. was that big a celebrity. Now, O.J. 
is at McDonald's with Cato, right? They're at the drive-thru. Now, even if you don't recognize O.J. Simpson, how many Bentleys are there at a McDonald's? Right? How, how many? I believe this is a mistake. Perhaps O.J. wanted to be noticed at the McDonald's. Maybe in his mind, being noticed before the crime takes place would have led people to conclude that he didn't have enough time to do the crime, right? Although, there's a big hole in that thought process, right? He has a guy in the car with him, Cato Kalin. Once you have a guy in the car with you, that guy, when questioned by police, could give the police a timeline. And if that timeline's accurate, the police would then figure out, well, he got back to Rockingham at this time. He had enough time then to go over to Nicole's place to do this crime. Well, anyway, let's just put it this way. Even in Los Angeles, even in Brentwood, Bentleys at drive through windows at McDonald's are noticeable. Right, let's just say if OJ wanted to keep a low profile before a planned crime, this was not the way to go about it, right? Bentley, person in the car with him. Well, let me say this too. Times of the essence, if you believe OJ did the crime, OJ treats time as if it's of the essence. He eats his food in the car on the way home. Right? Now, let's go deeper into the night. It is now 9.35 p.m., about 40 minutes before the murders. Cato leaves O.J. standing near the Bentley at the Rockingham Estate. Now here's where it gets interesting. If you believe that O.J. Simpson did this crime, and if you believe in the integrity of the evidence presented at the trial, then O.J. would have to have everything already set up. Right? The ski cap he supposedly wore. The gloves. Keep in mind, it's June in L.A. He doesn't have gloves with him because it's cold. Right? He has gloves. Dark clothing. Knife. There's simply no time at 9.35 to suddenly decide, you know what? Let me go over my ex's place with a knife, with gloves. Let me go find all this stuff. I don't know about you, but in June, I have a very hard time trying to gather winter stuff. Right? If I have a pair of gloves, it would take me a while. So, O.J. Simpson at 935, if you believe he did the crime, is all prepared. He had to have been prepared before the trip to McDonald's. So, let's just talk this through about mistakes OJ made that night right I believe here OJ falls apart on his feet are Bruno Magli shoes right shoes in which he was photographed by several different photographers who did not know each other when he was at a Buffalo Bills game. In other words, he can't claim plausibly that he never had a pair of Bruno Maglis. He's already worn this style of shoe out in public and been photographed doing so. I believe the fact that he has these shoes on his feet are a big mistake. It's an oversight on his part. It gets worse than that. O. 
OJ wears a size 12. The shoes he's wearing are a size 12. Right? People who want to throw off police will wear shoes that aren't their size. Right? They'll have on size 14s. You leave footprints at the murder scene. Someone links them back to your shoe. You can then have your lawyer say, hey, that's nice, but that's not my client's size. Here, OJ's wearing his size. Big mistake. Right? Don't wear your actual shoes to a crime scene. Well, let's continue. What vehicle does he drive to the crime scene? And I understand there are those out there, Martin Sheen, for example, who has a series on ID network right now, claiming that two people are in the Bronco. We'll get to that. But let's just say what vehicle transports OJ or does OJ drive to the murder scene? It's his Ford Bronco. His white Ford Bronco. Can you be more obvious? Why wear dark clothes if you're going to show up in a white Ford Bronco? <laughs> By the time you're stepping out the car, I've already noticed the vehicle. Right? Well, how do we know? OJ drove a white Ford Bronco. Folks, somebody sees him. Okay, let's be blunt here. Here's where I criticize the prosecution. Because this person should have been front and center at the trial. Right? At about 10.45 p.m. Now here, the timeline gets a little jumbled. Right? Let me be the first to say the timeline gets a little jumbled. But at about 10.45 p.m. after the murders, right, after the murders, so understand the murders would have taken place before then. Single mother Jill Shively was trying to get to a store that closed at 11 p.m. Right now she admits the clock in her vehicle might have been a little fast, right? Well, at the intersection of San Vicente and Bundy, which, by the way, if you were to go from the Coles place to O.J. Simpson's Rockingham estate, is right along the direct route, right? She sees a white Bronco, almost has an accident with the Bronco. The Bronco has the lights off and that's important because clearly the person in the Bronco is not thinking coherently since I believe the person in the Bronco is OJ Simpson this is another mistake I'm leaving a murder scene, folks. I want to blend in as much as you can in a white vehicle. I want to blend in with traffic. I don't want it to be around 1045 at night and I have my lights off. What would have happened if the cops would have just said, hey, this guy's his lights off? They'd have probable cause to stop the vehicle, wouldn't they? Well, understand that the Bronco almost hits Jill Shively's car. Right? It almost hits the car. The Bronco gets stuck behind a gray Nissan. The driver of the Bronco starts yelling at the driver of the Nissan. Shively from a distance of 15 to 20 feet at that point, looks at OJ and recognizes him. Just like I did when I ran into OJ at the Laguna Beach restaurant. Right? Recognizable guy. Also understand, Shively happened to have lived in the area for eight years. 
from time to time, she would see O.J. Simpson. Folks, this is West Los Angeles. She would see O.J. Simpson. She knew what he looked like. O.J. was a celebrity. So, here's where it gets interesting. So, Jill Shively was so shaken by seeing the white Bronco with the lights off, O.J. yelling at another driver, O.J. driving recklessly, almost hitting her car, that she wrote down O.J.'s license plate number. Google all of this. Now, she didn't get every digit right. She didn't. She was off by one digit. One. Let me uh, say this. O.J. Simpson driving erratically from the murder scene. Big mistake in his car. Big mistake. Just understand he was seen shortly after the murders took place. At an intersection toward the Rockingham estate going in the same direction he would be going if he was leaving Nicole's place. Now here's where it gets interesting. Even more interesting. Jill Shively is not the only person to have seen O.J. Simpson's white Bronco that night. Folks, we live in a modern time. You can Google these names here online. Let me also point out too, Jill Shively, single mother, she accepted some money from a media outlet to give an interview. Right? Money was tight. Living in LA, it can be expensive. Because of that, Marsha Clark decided that she didn't trust her. It could also be because Marsha Clark had a second witness who saw a white sports utility vehicle leaving the scene of the crime. Robert Heistra, his last name is spelled H-E-I-D-S-T-R-A, is walking two dogs. He hears Nicole's Akita barking. He hears, in his words, a young, clear voice say, hey, 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 right? Young, clear. He then hears an older voice argue back, right? Can't quite clearly make out the words, but let's just say he hears a younger voice, then he hears an older voice. He then sees a, his words, white Jeep-like car, white Jeep-like car that then speeds away from the scene. Now understand, had Hystra seen a white car, but had the white car been a Volkswagen, had it been a pickup truck, all of us would say, hey, that that's not OJ's Ford Bronco. No, but it's a white Jeep-like car. Same color as OJ's. Jeep-like. Like OJ's. Second witness. OJ makes other mistakes. Let's not forget this. Right? OJ cuts his hand at the murder scene. If he doesn't cut his hand at the murder scene, his blood wouldn't have been at the murder scene. Certainly not on the back gate of the murder scene. If he didn't cut his left hand, then his fresh wound on his left hand would not have corresponded to the blood drops on the left side 
of the size 12 Bruno Maglia footprints left at the murder scene. Let's continue. Now I'm not going to mention the extra large Aris leather gloves. Right? I myself don't fully believe the cop story of finding one at the murder scene and one at the Rockingham estate. That sounds too convenient. Understand, this is not the first crime video I'm making here on YouTube. There are too many cases where cops have convenient reasons as to why they haven't, in my opinion, fully complied with the Constitution or the constitutional rights of the accused. I don't trust or like the idea of a cop hopping a fence without a search warrant who is not in pursuit of a suspect and who is driving distance from the crime. In other words, okay, I get it if the cop's hopping the fence next door to the crime because he thinks someone just ran to that location, right? There's an emergency. It's urgent. But I don't buy this case, right? They're over at Bundy. Hours pass, not minutes. Then they hop in vehicles and drive over to Rockingham. <laughs> then I'm supposed to believe that the cops, after seeing a smidge of blood on the door of the Bronco, suddenly decide that they don't need a search warrant. They're going to have Mark Furman hop the fence. In other words, folks, it's not even open. He has to get over the barrier. And after he does that, he's collecting evidence. Folks, I'm, I'm not buying it. Right? I'm not buying that at all. But I do believe that OJ, in yet another mistake, right, Crimes, especially crimes of passion, people overlook things. I believe that OJ didn't fully wipe the blood off the door of the Bronco. I believe that OJ didn't have plastic bags, think trash bags, think hefty, etc., in the Bronco to prevent bloody footprints and blood from getting on the floor and from getting on the center console. Right? Blood's found in both places. When OJ parks the Bronco back home after the murder, he messes up further. In my opinion, hindsight's 100%, he should have parked the car near someone else's home. Right? Park it across the street a few houses down. Give yourself the opportunity to pretend that somebody stole your car. So when the cops are telling you things like your car was seen at the murder scene, you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, it's how's that possible? Isn't my car parked in front of my house? Then the cops say, oh no, it's it's parked a few houses over. Then you say, wow, I didn't park it there. Why would I? But that's not what happened here, right? OJ parks the car by his house. And of course, the manner in which the car is parked looks like it was hurriedly parked. Folks, if you're gonna park it by your property, make sure the car is perfectly parked. Here, it wasn't straight. It wasn't parallel to the curb. Now, I'll agree with critics who say, you know, it was close. Who perfectly parks all the time. I'll agree with that. But here the cops looked at the car. They were able to see that the car was parked at a slight angle. The prosecution was able to argue at trial that the car was hurriedly parked and that it fit their theory of the case. That the driver was in a rush because that driver, O.J. Simpson, 
was coming from the scene of a double homicide that he did. Let me also say to the cops, and cops are creative. I believe after the fact, cops sit down with attorneys and they come up with arguments that would justify their actions. So, of course, the cops claim that the car, which was slightly askew, gave them the feeling that there was an emergency situation going on at the house. Right? That maybe O.J. was rushing or someone was rushing, left blood on the door, ran into the house, and that that's where the cops had to be <laughs> to protect everyone. Now, while I consider that to be pure fiction, understand the mistake O.J. made, and I believe it was O.J. who made this mistake, and not perfectly parking his car. Even given the rushed nature of the night, right? by not perfectly parking his car, O.J. left himself vulnerable to that argument. Then, of course, there is the thump that Cato hears. That's another mistake by L.J. Then there are the blood drops that go into Simpson's mansion. Remember, Simpson has a cut left hand. I know Simpson wants you to believe that he cuts the hand in Chicago. Let's just say the next morning he has a cut left hand. Right? Let's just say that there are blood drops leading into Rockingham and their Simpsons blood drops. Understand, if you believe the police planted evidence, everything gets too contorted for a defense attorney. Right? You say, you know, the cops planted this blood. But then you have to admit that your guy, your client, <laughs> has a fresh cut on his hand that, that drips blood. Let's just say a reasonable jury might think to themselves, you know what, this defense attorney, he's making stuff up here. His guy's cut, their blood drops, and I'm supposed to believe, no, the, the cops planted the blood drops. Right? Story's a little bit confused. Especially when they then want you to know he's cut now. But he wasn't cut then. Also understand the O.J. defense claimed that O.J. didn't even walk in the house with the cut. Right? O.J.'s supposed to have overslept in the house. Then, of course, there is the limo driver, Alan Park. Folks, if you're going to commit a murder and you don't want witnesses, don't have a limo driver at your house at 10.25 p.m. waiting to pick you up while you're someplace else doing bad deeds. So, Alan Park, of course, sees a shadowy figure walk into O.J.'s house right before O.J. answers the intercom. Right? So, think about it. You don't just have blood drops. You have the shadowy figure and you have a witness who sees the shadowy figure and the timing works out so that the shadowy figure enters the house and then suddenly it's OJ's voice on the intercom, right? Finally, OJ should have dumped his bloody socks, which had Nicole's blood on them, wherever he dumped the knife, right? Which has never been found. Here, O.J. makes one of the biggest mistakes he makes that night. O.J. thinks he's home free. Right? He goes all the way home with the bloody socks. He leaves the bloody socks in his bedroom. Understand, to me, that's game, set, and match, right? Two people are killed. You mean to tell me I find the guy's bloody socks in his house 
after the murder. Right? OJ got reckless. He has the cover story. I was on my way to Chicago. He has additional cover stories. I cut my hand in Chicago. Right? He even has a cover story for before the murders. I was at a McDonald's with Cato Kalin. He has all of that mapped out. He found a way to get rid of the knife, the murder weapon. How could he slip up here and forget to get rid of the bloody socks? Folks, Nicole is almost decapitated. The scene is extremely bloody, extremely bloody. How could OJ not realize that the blood was on his socks? Also, you're a celebrity. You're leaving the state. You had to realize that the minute the press got wind of this murder, right, the press was going to descend near your house. How could you have anything in the house that had Nicole's blood on it? Right? Big mistake. Keep in mind, this is separate and distinct from the bloody glove. I could believe that the cop's story sounds a little bit fishy. The idea of one glove at the murder scene, one glove at the suspect's house, sounds way too convenient to me. But wow, socks. How does that happen? Am I supposed to believe that the cops show up and they're taking OJ socks out and dousing it with blood? So, I don't believe the cops were Boy Scouts here. I don't buy the whole glove narrative. Obviously, the guy who found the glove, Mark Furman, didn't tell the full truth at trial, right? The N word isn't a distraction here. The guy lies about using the N-word. There's a tape of him using the N-word, and he's the guy operating without a warrant that night, and the cops want me to believe that when they're at OJ's house hours after the murder, they were there to protect the inhabitants of OJ's house, even though OJ lived miles away from the murder scene. Right? So, I do have doubts about the cops. I'll concede. I'm someone who holds the prosecution to a very high standard. They have to show me proof beyond a reasonable doubt. When you have cops who have a story that sounds fanciful to me, Right? Hours after the murder, we hopped in cars, went to a second location, then decided we didn't need a search warrant. Right? You know, I didn't use the N-word. Oh, you know what? Okay, I admit I used the N-word and I was taped doing it. Right? I'll concede I'm someone who, at a criminal trial especially given that there's missing cc's of blood and the police were less than exemplary in doing their chain of custody of the blood evidence, I may well have found O.J. not guilty in a criminal trial, even though I personally feel he committed the murders, simply because in a criminal trial you have a standard of proof. And if I'm here doubting the integrity of the police, if the police have to admit, hey, we were sloppy in measuring the blood, right? If a key piece of evidence, a bloody glove, is obtained without a search warrant, then I have problems with that. But understand, I would have found O.J. liable in the civil case, right? O.J isn't telling the truth about much here. 
right? Even in the car with Alan Park on the way to the airport, Alan Park claimed that OJ was hot, right? OJ was a bit excited, right? He was hot, wanted the windows down, just like a guy who just did something physically demanding, like kill two people, would have been. Right? So, I do believe that it is more likely than not that O.J. Simpson killed two people. Understand, if it's not him, then it's someone who drove a white Jeep-like vehicle who Jill La um, Shively saw who looked like OJ, right? An African-American, right? Understand the timeline for OJ's night just happens to have a gap. Understand, too, that OJ would have left to go to the airport just when somebody else thumps Cato Kalin's room and then moves across the courtyard right where OJ's blood is found. Before OJ answers the intercom to talk with his limo driver. That's too many coincidences. Let me also close by saying there are times here online when I profile a case, the Dana Chandler case, where I feel the person's innocent, where I feel the person should not have even been prosecuted. Let's just say I feel the cops don't have a case for prosecution, whatever their suspicion. Right? Go through the, go through the videos here online. When I feel someone's been railroaded, I'll tell you. Here, I believe O.J. killed two people. There's simply too much evidence. Understand, the prosecution made a mistake, in my opinion, in not putting Jill Shively on the stand. Right? Understand, a second witness sees a white Jeep-like vehicle. You have two people Two people who could put O.J.'s vehicle near the scene of the crime. Now, I know some will say, well, how do you know it's O.J.'s vehicle? Maybe it was a different, a different white Jeep-like vehicle. When you're in a situation like this and the vehicle matches the color of the accused car, when the vehicle matches the shape of the accused car. When the accused has several moments where the evidence could have exonerated him. Understand, we're not here talking about OJ if it's somebody else's blood at the murder scene. Right? We're, we're not here talking about OJ if O.J. actually meets his limo driver as planned at the time the murders are taking place. Then you'd have a witness that exonerates him. He'd be in a different place. We're not here talking about O.J. if there's not blood, both on the door of O.J.'s Bronco and inside O.J.'s Bronco. Right? It's not just that two people saw a white vehicle. It's that a white vehicle with the victim's blood is then right by OJ's house. We wouldn't be talking about OJ if the blood at the murder scene from the person who did the crime isn't on exactly the same side of the footprints as the blood would be from O.J.'s injured left hand if he was the person who did the murder. So, I have the utmost respect, the utmost, 
for Barry Sheck, who's done great work with the Innocence Project. I have the utmost respect for Alan Dershowitz. I have the utmost respect for Henry Lee, Johnny Cochran. OJ had an excellent defensive team. Few people know how to handle the media better than Robert Shapiro. But make no mistake, they had a client, in my opinion, who did the murders. Right? I'm not buying the idea that he just happened to be unlucky. Or that someone decided, hey, we found two dead people. Of all the people in Los Angeles, let's try to frame the wealthy celebrity. Right, the wealthy celebrity who lives a mile away from the murder scene, who can afford top-notch lawyers, who might not even be in the state of California at the time of the murders, right? Keep in mind, OJ leaves the state shortly after the murders take place. Folks, to me, that's not a coherent or realistic narrative. It just isn't. Right? And am I supposed to also believe that by chance, by chance, OJ was complaining about Nicole's tight dress earlier to his housemate. By chance, OJ wanted to go to dinner with the victim and got rebuffed. I'm just not buying the defense here. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.